Let's talk about acute liver failure. First, we will review the clinical definition. Then, we will create a framework for identifying the etiology. Next, we will review treatment principles, and finally, identify potential complications and interventions to mitigate risk. Let's start with the clinical definition of acute liver failure. The diagnosis of acute liver failure should be considered in any patient with clinical or laboratory evidence of acute liver injury or hepatitis. Put more simply, elevated LFT should trigger further evaluation. Next, there must be evidence of coagulopathy, defined as an INR greater than or equal to 1.5. Next, the patient must be encephalopathic. The West Haven criteria are utilized to grade hepatic encephalopathy, or HE. The West Haven criteria grade HE on a 1 through 4 scale. Grade 1 HE is defined by subtle behavioral changes and alteration of the sleep wake cycle. Grade 2 HE is defined by the onset of asterixis, a form of negative myoclonus defined by transient loss of postural tone, as well as lethargy and disorientation. Grade 3 HE is defined by more severe confusion, disorientation, and somnolence. Finally, Grade 4 is defined by coma. Why are these grades important to recognize in a patient with acute liver failure? The answer, cerebral edema incidence. Cerebral edema is rarely observed in patients with grade 1 and 2 HE. However, the incidence increases to 25-35% to in patients with grade 3 and 65-75% to in patients with grade 4. We will talk about cerebral edema in more detail later in the video. In order to diagnose acute liver failure, all of these abnormalities must be occurring in a patient without pre-existing cirrhosis and with an illness course of less than 26 weeks duration. Notable exceptions to the 26-week rule include Wilson disease, reactivation of hepatitis B virus, and autoimmune hepatitis. Next, let's create a framework for identifying the etiology of acute liver failure. We will use the framework to help guide our initial workup. We can break down causes of acute liver failure into two major categories, vascular and parenchymal. Let's start with the vascular category. Patients can develop acute hepatic vein thrombosis, known as the Bud-Chiari syndrome. Bud-Chiari syndrome is often associated with polycythemia, malignancy, and other prothrombotic states. In addition, ischemic damage to the liver from low flow arterial states can lead to failure. This is often referred to as shock liver. In this case, the acronym shock can be utilized. Septic, hypovolemic or hemorrhagic, obstructive, cardiogenic, and combos of any of the above. We work up the vascular causes by obtaining an ultrasound of the liver with Dopplers and assessing for various shock states with broad cultures and a transthoracic echocardiogram. Next, let's discuss the parenchymal causes of acute liver failure. The parenchymal causes can be further subdivided into five categories, tox, viral, autoimmune, infiltrative, and pregnancy. Let's go through these one by one. The leading cause of acute liver failure in North America is acetaminophen overdose, accounting for approximately 45% of cases. Typical ingestions causing failure exceed 10 grams per day, but failure can occur with doses as low as 4 grams per day. The second most common cause is drug-induced from any number of drugs and supplements. Additional toxicologic causes include cocaine, alcohol, and the Amanita phylloides, or death cap, mushroom. To work up toxicologic etiologies, we obtain an acetaminophen level, urine and serum toxicology screen, and perform a thorough medication and supplement review if possible, including a review of the liver tox online database. Of the viral etiologies, hepatitis A, B, D, and E all cause acute liver failure. Of note, hep C alone does not appear to cause acute liver failure. Hepatitis B virus is most common in the USA, accounting for approximately 8% of cases. Hep E is a more frequent cause in endemic areas, Russia, Pakistan, Mexico, and India. Additional viral etiologies include HSV, VZV, CMV, and EBV. To work up viral etiologies, we obtain the serology shown below. The most common autoimmune etiology is autoimmune hepatitis, 
We evaluate for autoimmune hepatitis by obtaining an ANA, anti-smooth muscle antibody, anti-LKM antibody, and immunoglobulins, as IgG is often elevated. Infiltrative etiologies include Wilson disease, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis, HLH, and malignancy. Wilson disease is suggested by a history of hepatic, neurologic, and psychiatric abnormalities. On LFTs, a ratio of total bilirubin to alkaline phosphatase greater than 2 may be suggestive. To work up infiltrative etiologies, we obtain a ceruloplasmin, ferritin, and additional imaging if necessary. Pregnancy-associated etiologies include acute fatty liver of pregnancy and HELP syndrome. A urine and serum beta-HCG should be obtained. Overall, ischemia, acetaminophen, drug-induced, hepatitis B virus, and autoimmune hepatitis account for approximately 80% of acute liver failure cases in the USA. Once we have diagnosed acute liver failure and initiated the workup, we transition to the most important aspect, treatment. All patients with acute liver failure should be managed in an ICU at a transplant center with a GI or hepatology console. In the ICU, patients should receive standard evidence-based airway management and respiratory support, fluid resuscitation, and cardiovascular support. In addition, all patients should receive N-acetylcysteine, or NAC. A 2009 placebo-controlled RCT by Lee et al. randomized 173 patients with acute liver failure without clinical or historical evidence of acetaminophen overdose to either NAC infusion or placebo for 72 hours. While overall survival at three weeks was similar for both groups, patients in the NAC group had a higher transplant-free survival at three weeks compared to placebo, 40% versus 27%. Notably, this benefit was only observed in patients with grade 1 and 2 hepatic encephalopathy. Therefore, patients with both acetaminophen-induced and non-acetaminophen-induced acute liver failure should receive NAC on presentation. Discontinuation of the medication is guided by GI or hepatology. Next, a cyclovir is often initiated until HSV and VZV infection can be ruled out. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, it is imperative that we be prepared to manage potential complications of acute liver failure. We will use this table to identify the major functions of the liver, what happens when the liver fails, how we monitor for potential complications, and interventions to mitigate risk. First, the liver converts ammonia into urea for excretion. When the liver fails, ammonia levels increase. Ultimately, hyperammonemia leads to astrocyte swelling within the brain. If severe enough, this process leads to cerebral edema and intracranial hypertension, ICH, and ultimately herniation. Cerebral edema and its complications are a common cause of death in acute liver failure. For patients with acute liver failure, the serum ammonia concentration correlates with the risk of intracranial hypertension. Patients with ammonia levels less than 75 rarely develop ICH. Greater than 100 is a risk factor for high-grade hepatic encephalopathy, and greater than 200 predicts the development of ICH. We can monitor for cerebral edema with Q1-hour neurochecks and CT of the head for any acute changes in mental status. We mitigate the risk of cerebral edema by elevating the head of the bed to 30 degrees, keeping a net even fluid balance via CRRT if necessary, and allowing for hyperventilation. In addition, we can induce hypernatremia to 145 to 155 with hypertonic saline to decrease water entry into astrocytes and brain cells. Finally, mannitol can be administered if there is concern for herniation. Second, the liver stores glycogen and is a major site of gluconeogenesis. When the liver fails, hypoglycemia may develop. We monitor for hypoglycemia with frequent blood glucose checks we treat hypoglycemia with a dextrose infusion. Third, the liver synthesizes clotting factors, with the exception of factor VIII, which is produced by endothelial cells, and synthesizes anticoagulants, protein C and S. When the liver fails, patients are at increased risk for both bleeding and clotting. As the INR may not be an accurate reflection of overall coagulopathy, the functional coagulation status of patients with acute liver failure is best monitored with a thromboelastogram, or TEG. 
Coagulopathy should not be corrected unless bleeding occurs or an invasive procedure needs to be performed. All patients with acute liver failure should receive stress ulcer prophylaxis with either an H2 receptor antagonist or proton pump inhibitor, as well as thromboembolic prophylaxis with either low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. Finally, a healthy liver decreases our risk of infection. The Kuffer cell, a liver macrophage, plays a key role in innate immunity. When the liver fails, patients are at increased risk for infection. Patients should be cultured on initial presentation and any time there is concern for infection. All known infections should be treated aggressively. In addition, we should have a low threshold for empiric antibiotics if the patient decompensates or the source is unknown. In this video, we reviewed the clinical definition of acute liver failure, elevated LFTs, plus coagulopathy, plus encephalopathy in a patient without pre-existing cirrhosis and an illness course less than 26 weeks. We then created the vascular versus parenchymal framework for identifying the etiology. Then, we reviewed treatment principles, including the importance of transfer to an ICU at a transplant center and NAC for all patients. And finally, we discussed potential complications of acute liver failure, including cerebral edema, hypoglycemia, bleeding and clotting, and infection. Shown is an overview of each objective's whiteboard. Thank you for watching.